this is a line. But what is a line? A line is a mark we put on a blank canvas, something we use to construct meaning. A line is our intrusion into empty space, a tool we use to catch the eye, guide the steps, impose order. A line is a signpost. On plain white paper, a line contextualizes the space into parts that matter and parts that don't. We fill up that paper with lines, shaping them into words and images, the parts that matter. And we gradually erode the territory of untouched places, the parts that don't. A line is a border between here and there, this and that, then and now, us and them. Lines separate, lines divide. And once lines have been drawn, it's hard to picture the canvas without them anymore. Lines have a way of feeling like inevitabilities regardless of their age, as though all blank spaces existed simply waiting for lines to entangle them. This is a line, a thin red line. But what is a thin red line? The term originates in 1854, referencing an episode from the Battle of Balaclava during the Crimean War, in which a Scottish infantry regiment of 500 soldiers fired upon a Russian cavalry five times its size, driving them away temporarily. The British press used the image of a line of red-coated soldiers standing athwart their swarming enemies to exalt British military resolve and grace under pressure. The term thin red line came to represent any smaller, understaffed force valiantly holding firm under attack, protecting the motherland from being ravaged by outsiders. I suppose it doesn't matter that this episode was ultimately irrelevant and that the British allied forces lost the Battle of Balaclava, setting the stage for much bloodier conflicts to come. It did make a nice oil painting after all. This is a line. A thin blue line. But what is a thin blue line? After the Battle of Balaclava coronated thin red line as a mainstay of English idiom, the format spread to other professions, and somewhere in the early 1900s, American police began to refer to themselves as the thin blue line, marrying the color of their uniforms to the metaphor. It was beloved Los Angeles Police Chief William H. Parker who made it a frequent refrain in his speeches, up to and including using his city connections to convince Hollywood to produce a propaganda TV show of the same name. Parker understood that marketing was a key element of modern policing, and that controlling the narrative covered over a multitude of sins. William H. Parker, it should be noted, was also deeply racist towards the black and brown people living in Los Angeles, and his heavy-handed approach to law enforcement led directly to the Watts riots in 1965. During the riots, Parker went on television and said the following, It is estimated that by 1970, 45% of the metropolitan area of Los Angeles will be Negro. If you want any protection for your home and family, you're going to have to get in and support a strong police department. If you don't, come 1970, God help you. William H. Parker believed the police were the thin blue line protecting white residents from their non-white neighbors and was able to use the media to spread that idea all across the United States. While the term has been a mainstay of police culture for decades, it found a newer, darker energy in 2014. Andrew Jacob, a white bro from an affluent suburb, was reflecting on the recent Black Lives Matter demonstrations against the police murders of people like Eric Garner, Michael Brown, 
and Tamir Rice. As the Rice family mourned the murder of their 12-year-old child a few weeks earlier, Jacob lamented that the police didn't have a special flag to rally around and decided he could no longer stomach living in such a wretched country. He promptly got to work creating and profiting from the modern thin blue line flag we see today. Now, there was already a thin blue line flag popular in Europe and Australia, but for Andrew Jacob, it lacked the jingoism necessary to truly represent the American spirit. In Jacob's mind, his recolor of the national banner more perfectly captured exactly what the line represented to him. Uh, the black above represents citizens, he told journalist Jeff Charlotte, and the black below represents criminals. Jacob has gone on to run a thriving business selling thin blue line flags, shirts, hats, bumper stickers, and other attire well suited to feasting on freshly polished boot leather. Jacob's creativity in repurposing designs did not stop at palette swapping someone else's flag. He also began selling pro-police merch featuring the Punisher logo. The Punisher, for those who don't know, is a comic book anti-hero famous for breaking the law to murder criminals without due process. Jacob's thin blue line Punisher mashup captured the imaginations of thousands of cops who fantasized about the exhilarating freedom of extrajudicial executions. Punisher co-creator Jerry Conway has since vehemently denounced the use of the logo in pro-police merchandise, reminding us that the Punisher has always represented a systematic failure of equal justice. Somewhere during this aesthetic commercialization, the thin blue line flag became the unofficial symbol of the white backlash to the nascent Black Lives Matter movement. It provided ample ideological cover for polite Americans to tune out black pain while telling themselves they were simply supporting the rule of law. As activists became more and more vocal about the police proclivity for executing black people, Law enforcement and their allies desperately tried to steer the narrative away from their own bad behavior and focus instead on officers killed in the line of duty, a number that, while it represents legitimate human tragedy, has been trending downwards for almost half a century. Less than a year after 12-year-old Tamir Rice was buried, the Blue Lives Matter movement was born, with the thin blue line as its emblem, partially to mourn the uniformed dead but principally to distract from the actions of the officers still living, a cynical palette swap of someone else's pain. While at first glance these lines might just seem like mere aesthetic posturing, the simplicity of the colors and symbols betrays a deep historical complexity lying just beneath the surface. In his essay, Killing the Future, Nicholas Price recalls the ways in which Reconstruction-era backlash against emancipation set the stage for the racial violence of the modern war on drugs. In the South, white plantation owners pushed for the black codes, which criminalized everyday life. Being unemployed or failing to pay a tax became a crime. Cops pulled thousands of black people into the ever-growing convict lease system that recycled the debris of slavery into a new form. In each generation, law enforcement has been the thin blue line against the black freedom movement. Today, the war on drugs, like the convict lease system before it, has become an industry where the raw material fueling an ever-growing prison infrastructure is the criminalized black body. From the economic base of mass incarceration, a superstructure rises that trains white people, once again, to see blackness in a new version of the same old visual vocabulary. The drug dealer, the thug, the rapper, the hoe, the pimp, and the junkie. The old racial line between black and white has been redrawn as the line between criminal and citizen. Thus, it seems law enforcement has always enforced a racial hierarchy and, when it was stripped of the right to attack blackness openly, it simply redrew the lines defining law and order to swallow up people living in poverty, using that as a pretext to criminalize communities denied jobs, housing, and opportunity because of their race. 
Professor Diren Valadin observed this intersection of race and criminality and coined the term racial feralization, meaning the societal fear that without intervention, humanity might regress into a primitive state, leading to a volatile landscape of random violence. This fear is used by government agencies to deploy old tactics of racial oppression against new targets. He writes, Racial feralization allows various agencies to identify, name, and govern a population in racial terms. In turn, it legitimizes the application of a number of techniques of sorting and technologies of control and care to those identified as feral. The range of actions deployed by security apparatuses across the urban landscape speaks to the possibilities open for power by racial feralization and targeting. The criterion for suspicion during stop and frisk by the New York City Police Department was revealed in court as furtive movement, which included everything from walking in a certain way to moving in and out of a car too quickly, grabbing at a certain pocket or something at their waist getting a little nervous, maybe shaking, or all of a sudden becoming very nervous, very aware. This kind of behavioral sorting blends two concerns over racial feralization. The urban landscape is volatile and unsafe with beings whose violence is random. Little separates civilian, bystander, and suspected in the categorical elasticity employed by the police in an environment perceived as hostile. The same process creeps into urban designs as demonstrated by structures such as narrow benches and spikes, backed by laws against panhandling, erected in campaigns against the homeless. Racial feralization demarcates populations, creates the saved and the damned, and is invoked to distribute resources, to delimit security, and ultimately, to draw out the limits of the human. This is important to remember. When you hear police and their allies invoke the image of a thin blue line between law and lawlessness, don't forget this line is both elastic and porous. The categories of civilian and criminal, of innocent and guilty, are arbitrary and frequently racialized. And if you think whiteness might protect you from this, Professor Valadin goes on to state, As capitalism is increasingly defined by the circulation of goods, what cannot be absorbed into its revenue stream are the wastes, human and otherwise, that it produces. Those that are targeted by the discourse of racial feralization comprise this human waste, and it is to these that a series of techniques and technologies of social cleansing derived explicitly from historical experiments in racial management can be applied. Race provides the model of social war, and it also defines the parameters of belonging and abandonment the thresholds of sufferings and vulnerabilities. How confident are you that you'll always be a profitable asset under capitalism? If the 2020 pandemic has taught us anything, it's that millions of people who thought they had steady work were nearly instantly deemed unnecessary by our government and the corporations that own it. As climate change lights the fuse on yet unknown catastrophes, none of us should feel safe in a world enslaved by profiteers. This is a line, a thin blue line. But what is a line? A line is a mark we use to construct meaning to build an image of the carceral state as necessary, heroic even, an image of beleaguered police forces stretched thin, struggling against the battering tides, endangering their lives in service to their fatherland. A line is a signpost, contextualizing the behaviors happening inside the lines as patriotism and tough love, whereas behaviors outside the line are deviant, depraved, dangerously undermining our fragile society. A line is a border, 
When I was a police officer, we frequently claimed to be the thin blue line between order and chaos. We claimed to be an aegis between the innocent civilians and the barbarians at the gate. We protected you from, you know, them. But don't you think that's an exceptionally dangerous attitude for law enforcement to adopt? After all, police don't interact with space pirates and goblin hordes or invading armies. They interact with the people who live in their community. There are no barbarians, and no chaos on the other side of the police, only our friends and neighbors. Friends and neighbors who might be in crisis because of poverty, inadequate health care, or any number of situations that do not make them our enemies. Doesn't police adopting an image of themselves with origins in war strike a discordant note against the classic police motto of to protect and to serve? Doesn't it seem wrong for them to be the line dividing those who deserve dignity and those who don't? After all, if the police are a dividing line, it means that not all of us deserve to be protected, and not all of us are worthy of service. It means they mark the boundary between people who are part of society and people who aren't. Where they stand determines who is us and who is, you know, them. We must reckon with the history of lions in America. It is the history of slave trade routes slicing across the Atlantic, the history of whip marks and miles of chain, the history of trails tearfully walked by indigenous communities marched away from their homes at gunpoint, the history of a transcontinental railroad spiked into the backs of exploited immigrants, and the history of men with badges paid to beat blue-collar picketers into submission for corporate profits. The history of lines in America is thick and bloody, a wound that has never closed. I think it's time we stop admiring and accepting a world of lines, thin or otherwise. The lines don't keep us safe. They only keep us segmented into who's in and who's out. How confident are you that you'll never be out? Someday the line will move, and what's being done in your name today may be done in your face tomorrow. <laughs>